Welcome everyone. We're really pleased to have you join us in a forum on education and equity. Our presenter is Judy Pogue, and I am Marie Ann Shovlin of the League of Women Voters of Santa Clara County Council. And we hope you have a very educational and productive time with us today. Thank you. Judy? Welcome everyone. As Marie Ann said, I'm Judy Pogue and I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Committee on Civil Discourse and the League of Women Voters of Cupertino Sunnyvale. Thank you for joining us today to discuss education and equity. I want to thank my fellow committee members, Marie Ann Shovlin, Dan Zales, Ellen Forbes, Ellen Smith, Tony Stieber, Carol Watts, Nicole Sidovar, Rose Grimes, and Susan Owicki for all the input and support they provided helping clarify and expand the information about California's public school funding. As we've prepared for this presentation, we've had many conversations about the definition of equity. However, our major focus for the day is to inform you about the history and current status of California public school funding. The program begins with a series of slides to inform you about the way California schools were funded in the past and about the latest effort to meet the needs of students. Following that presentation, Marie Ann will begin the discussion with a question for you to consider and then send you to breakout rooms where facilitators will lead a process known as focused discussion. The process provides an opportunity for you to react and respond to the information shared in the presentation. We'll regather as a large group to hear feedback from a representative about looking forward to issues you might wish to learn more about. As we view the PowerPoint, I will provide some explanation that may not be detailed on the slide and will give you an opportunity to read the content. Some of the information is provided twice, once in words and again on tables or graphs. If you have questions, I encourage you to make a note so we can respond to them following the discussions. This presentation tells the history of state and local funding of schools, as well as describing the current model. Our <laughs> three objectives include describing the distribution of funding. You may have your own definition of equality and equity, which as I said earlier, has been something our committee has wrestled with. Providing information and opportunity to discuss what you learn is also one of the objectives. Money comes from local property taxes and state funds to pay for needs such as the salaries of teachers, and other employees and general maintenance and utilities. The state funds special needs under the local control funding formula, which will be explained in detail in a later slide. The graph shows the proportion of the annual but $100 billion in funds, which comes 9% from the federal government in blue, 58% from the state in orange, and 32% from local sources in gray. In 1971, the California Supreme Court ordered the state to equalize district funding. Legal cases heard by state courts from 1971 to 1983. The Serrano versus Priest case decision states, the commercial and industrial property, which augments a district's tax base, is distributed unevenly throughout the state. To allot more educational dollars to the children of one district than those of another, merely because of the fortuitous presence of such property, is to make the quality of a child's education dependent upon the location of private, commercial, and industrial establishments. In spite of this ruling, the amount some districts spend for each unit of average daily attendance 
can be substantially greater than others. Prior to the pop, uh, passage of Proper 13, Proposition 13, schools were mainly funded by local property tax. Property taxes were increasing rapidly at that time. If you were a property owner, if you are a property owner, you are probably familiar with both the benefits and the downsides of this tax law. With escalating housing costs, those of us who are longtime owners have benefited greatly as a result of the restriction on rate increases. Those who purchase a home for the first time at today's prices will be taxed based on the newly assessed value. Property tax income for school districts only increases substantially when there is a lot of turnover in housing or commercial property. The next few slides will cover some background of what has occurred since the passage of Proposition 13. In, in spite of Excuse me a moment, I have an extra page here. In spite of the changes in California's per pupil spending, uh, in spite of these changes, California's per pupil spending remains lower, 13% below the national average. This is based on uh, 2015 information. Per pupil spending statewide in 2015 was about $10,786 and was almost 13% below the average level of spending in the rest of the nation, which is 12, was $12,346. For many years, school districts were funded by the state based on their revenue limit. This was a figure that was established prior to the passage of Proposition 13 and vary greatly from district to district. Since the state generally provided the same percentage of an increase to these dollars to every district, there was no equalization. In 2013, local control funding formula became the basis for distributing, determining the state contribution. Now, all districts receive the same dollar amount per units of average daily attendance. It's not based on enrollment. Districts must report their average daily attendance quarterly through the school year to establish the subsequent year's funding. In addition to those basic funds, 20% additional funding is added to a district's allocation for each unduplicated count of students with special needs, which are defined as English language learners, those in poverty or in foster care. Unduplicated means that no student can be counted in more than one of those special need areas. This table shows the base grants per each unit of average daily attendance by grade level. The 2018-19 base limit was increased by a cost of living adjustment of 3.6% in, in 2019. Additional adjustments result in the amounts in the far right column. As you can see, the allocations for primary and high school students and, and are higher than the middle grades. The formula is still not simple, but has been described to me by a school district director of business services and a former school board member as much more fair than past funding methods. In 2018, base funding from the state was 48 billion with an additional 9.5 billion for special needs. If local property taxes are not sufficient to cover the base funding, the state allocates the balance and the 20% additional funds for special needs students. 
Local districts may increase their funds through parcel taxes, which are based on a unit of property rather than the value of the property. If you are a resident of Santa Clara County, you probably live in a school district that has put a parcel tax on the ballot. Such a tax requires a two thirds vote to pass. A bond measure also requires a two thirds vote when a school district needs funds to build new facilities. Special projects, equipment and extracurricular activities may be funded through grants or citizen fundraising. Since these are usually one-time money, they can't support ongoing expenses. There's some unique features about California public schools that may help you understand some of the other complexities that we deal with. One is the number and kinds of school districts in the state. We have K-12 districts, which are referred to as unified districts. We have elementary districts and high school districts and other for a total of 1,037 across the state. The total enrollment in California schools in 2019-20 was 6,163,001. And there were 10,588 schools. Previously referred to as basic aid districts, these community funded districts, these districts like to refer to themselves as community funded. For many years, every district in California received $120 per unit of average daily attendance, which was referred to as basic aid. Until the passage of property thir Prop 13, property taxes were the additional source of funds for school districts. As we learned in an earlier slide, this resulted in great differences in the amount of local funds for education. After Prop 13 passed, the state began to adjust what was considered base funding and provide state money to many districts. However, some districts received as much or more than they needed from property taxes. Those districts still received the $120 and, we were, and were referred to as basic aid districts since that was their main source of state funds. All districts at that time might still receive categorical funds for specific needs. Under the local control funding formula, community funded schools no longer receive the $120 per unit of average daily attendance. And there are no longer any categorical programs. This data from 2015 shows the 10 community funded districts in Santa Clara County. There are 102 of these districts in the state and 10 of them are in Santa Clara County. This, this chart shows the percentage of special needs students in each of these community funded districts. Although the property taxes in these districts meets or exceeds that considered the base amount, they still receive 20% additional funds that would be allocated from the state for each average daily attendance for those special needs students. We will be giving a closer look at Palo Alto Unified in one of our next slides. We've organized this list of districts with the lowest to highest percentage of students with special needs. We've chosen three Santa Clara County's Unified School districts. Those are the K-12 districts with an, uh, to show some, uh, to compare some statistics. The first is Milpitas with an annual budget of $115,757,306, a 
an average daily attendance of 9,951, a per pupil expenditure of $11,362. They have 46% special needs students and a parcel tax of $84 a year per parcel. We have chosen year to year performance letters, performance level of schools as one measure of the district's success. That data will be more easily understood in a graph on the future slide. Uh, Gilroy Unified has an annual budget of $128,503,512, an average daily attendance of 10,481, a per pupil expenditure of 12,260, and 59% of their students are either English learners living in poverty or are in foster care. They have no parcel tax. Palo, Al Palo Alto Unified is a community funded school district and has an annual budget of $263,967,064, an average daily attendance of 11,539, per pupil expenditure of 22,876, 17% of their students are special needs. Their parcel tax is $836 a year per parcel. This table allows you to see the data from all three districts simultaneously. You can look at Milpitas's, Gilroy and Palo Alto, the uh, community funded district, their annual budget, looking at the average daily attendance, the per pupil expenditure, the special needs students and the parcel tax. The graphs tell, help you to see the school, the performance change at each of the district schools from one year to the next in English and in math. The blue represents the percent of schools for which performance has significantly improved from year to year. The yellow represents schools performance for that have um, maintained, stayed the same. And the gray, um, no, the yellow represents the significant, pardon me, for which the yellow represents what's significant, what has improved and the gray for which was maintained in its performance and the red orange for which performance has declined. Marianne, if you will point out each of those, each of the separate school districts to show. This is the basic information we wanted you to have before your discussion. And Mary, Marianne is going to begin that discussion. This slide details our guiding principles and agreements for all civil communication. And the basic guideline is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And we will now uh, start a conversation using these agreements. I'll give you a minute to take a look through them. And we will talk about the data that Judy presented. And what I'd like you to do now, and that's, that's the, everybody in the group, is answer the question in just a few words. What key items stood out to, for you from the data that was presented? And how we'd like to do this is if, if you could just raise your hand uh, and we say your name and, and your league and just oh, no more than five words. 
what key item stood out for you from the data? Who would like to start? Uh, Marie Ann, if you stop the screen share, we'll be able to see everybody. Okay, now I hit, uh, I see Ellen has her hand up. Ellen? Um, yes, I have seen all this before. And this time, what struck me is that. Um, all of these districts that we've looked at, although the disparity is great, they all are at or above the U.S. average of expenditure per pupil. Uh -huh. And remember, we want to keep it to just a few words so that we can get everybody to participate. Uh, Sean, would you unmute, please? I, I thought it was interesting that the schools with the greatest need had the least amount of money. Uh, okay. And who else would like to share a few words about what key data they took away from the presentation? I see we have no key data taken away, huh? You want to call on people? I would ask Tony Steber, what, what do you what key data to you did you take away, Tony? I was actually gonna, gonna say that I, I agree with Sean. I just couldn't find the hands up button. I totally agree with Sean on that uh, the school district with the biggest needs got the least amount of money per student. And that's untenable. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Any other pieces of key data that you take away from this information? Um, Hung Wai, how about you? There is inequity in um, education. Is, are you looking at financial inequity or? Yeah, financial in inequity. Okay, all right. How about somebody else? Uh, Karen Kalinske. Karen, you please unmute. Hi, um, I noticed that the schools that had the greatest per pupil funding had the most progress in their educational aim. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Any other things that people noticed? Uh, Dan, how about you? Oh, I just, I pretty much noticed what a couple of other folks have said that, uh, you know, the greatest folks, uh, districts with the greatest need are getting the funded the least. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 which, what I found was interesting also was the amount that, of parcel tax that Palo Alto has, which really is way above even the, you know, it's like, and maybe that's really the key to uh, Palo Alto's success in making a lot of, getting a lot of money to its students. Uh-huh. How about, how about you, Janet? Um, I pretty much uh, noticed all the things that other people have mentioned. I. I was wondering um, how they determine special needs because I, I, I was actually surprised at how many special needs students, the percentage in some of the wealthier districts. Ah. And uh, anybody else have any other comments on, on what you noticed in that information? Uh, Marianne, could you just uh, repeat the three categories that are special needs so we can all remember? Or Judy? Yes. English language learners, children who are living in poverty, and children who are in foster care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In response to the question about uh, the districts with have rich districts have the some of the community funded districts having uh, high need students, if you will note the two districts that had the highest need 
Sunnyvale Elementary and Santa Clara Unified. Those are communities that have a very diverse population. Tony. Yeah, there's a comment earlier, and I forgot who it was, uh, it said that uh, she was surprised at how many high needs uh, people there were, uh, students there were in the, in the uh, wealthier areas. But I think some of it might come because there are many immigrants like myself, we don't speak English at home, and yet our kids, I suppose, would be considered to be high need, but are definitely not high need. So there might be some misclassification as well, I could imagine. Mm. Any other comments from, from the, the folks in the room right now? Okay. Um, we will be breaking in, uh, dividing up into breakout groups to continue our conversation. Each of the uh, breakout groups will have a, their own uh, facilitator assigned. And I want to ask Carol Watts, who is, uh, who is doing that great job of, of uh, dividing us up, if she is ready yet. Um, I have everyone assigned. I have only four. I have made four rooms. Uh, we are losing some people, though. So, <laughs> so rooms are, have three or four people in them. So we might reassign as we go on. Um, so uh, yes, we, we can start. And if there's any adjustments that have to be made, we'll make them afterwards. OK. Ready um, to go? Uh, you may have to answer, yes, I'll enter the room. I'm not sure. Okay, well, if you would take it away and put us into our rooms, we'll continue our conversation. We are a little ahead of schedule. We thought we might do a little report out from each of the three groups and talk about what uh, in responses to the changes that you would suggest to ensure equity, the values we should honor in school funding guidelines, and the next steps that, that we might take. So I, everybody's back now and we are recording. Well, I will be happy to start because uh, we were a group of um, two school board member, two, a school board member, a former school board member, a former teacher, and a former school administrator and a wonderful member of the League of Women Voters who wanted to learn about education. <laughs> uh, so um, I think one of the main things that we talked about was partnerships. Um, since the two school board members represented Fremont Union High School District and Sunnyvale Elementary District, uh, they were familiar with efforts that have been made to collaborate with both the city and with their um, other, the uh, Fremont Union and Sunnyvale or Fremont Union and Cupertino. Um, so collaboration and partnerships seems to be something that um, people agreed might be, members agreed might be helpful. Um, there's a lot of action that is happening with the Santa Clara County School Boards Association trying to act in a regional way. Mm -hmm. um, and community, working with the community where the community, the lot, one example that was given to us is that Sunnyvale Elementary, Fremont Union and the branch library that's being built are gonna have a collaborative program. So I think that was one of the, the really main things and Ellen might be able to add something else to that. Um, I just will, the other points that we had, we were concerned about uh, points of equity and any of your other notes, Judy, that you wanted to share besides just the last set of questions? Um, people were surprised that there were so many high need students in um, some of these uh, community funded districts. Um, there is concern that um, the money may not be directed at the right students. Um, and that 
it's not working as well as had been hoped. Um, let's see, I have another page of notes here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it, these, the, the discussion was going on that I kept getting involved in this. So I think those were the main things that, that we really talked, that's, oh, no, the, we also talked about the societal issues that kids who don't come to school prepared as well as other kids do, that it's that, you, it's very hard for kids to ever catch up. If it's, yeah. it's the, the living conditions, the uh, background, the lack of support, or just the, in, the poverty that exists in our, in, even in this county mm -hmm. that can make for a very big difference between how kids mm -hmm. learn. That a lot of school equity issues reflect the, the wide societal equity issues. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else from your group? I think that's where our, that was our focus. Let's give other people a chance. Okay. Uh, we had uh, three groups. So the who is the second group? We had the third group, I think, is Tony's group. But who was facilitating the second group? Dan. Dan. Is to unmute myself. Okay. Yeah, we uh, had a really good discussion. Also, we were all educators to, in some form or another. Uh, uh, it had all I had experience teaching or in school board and all that. So, uh, yeah, I think we uh, we talked about all the great things that money can buy uh, uh, in schools, such as professional development, teacher, teacher, greater teacher professional development. Uh, we talked about. Uh, we also talked about the early childhood challenge. You know, the, the lack of you know, of that. Um, we talked about um, uh, curricular, but teachers are able to buy curricula. So we talked a lot about the classroom experience, you know, what it's like, you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, and that, and if the teacher and teacher salaries, class size, uh, that uh, these are all factors that, that impact the, the nature of the instructional program. Uh, and the aware the availability of uh, electives and things like that and uh, extracurricular activities of computers, all these great things. Um, and we talked about how, uh, you know, I, I mentioned in passing that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, schools get grants that where they, they have some great project for three years and then funding runs, runs out and that's the end of it. Uh, so, um, well, we talked about as far as equity, uh, we kind of felt that, you know, uh, the uh, the additional funding for these high need students just needs to be upped. We we didn't think that like a district like Palo Alto should be deprived of funding, uh, you know, what it wants to fund, but we felt there needs to be a big, uh, the, 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 the amount of money that Palo Alto provides through its parcel tax should be made up, you know, uh, by provided through other means for, uh, to increase the funding for, um, to not to lower funding for anybody, but to increase funding for places like Gilroy and Lapidus. Uh, and, uh, you know, broadly, uh, I think we, uh, we also kind of touched on uh, kind of the, the administration, the roles of, of the administration, how important that can be for better or worse. And uh, uh, just mentioned in passing that, uh, you know, uh, students, uh, and this is an important point, uh, with good instructional methods, teachers uh, provide opportunities for students to express through active learning uh, themselves in different modalities. Like uh, an example was provided of, uh, from one of our teachers in our group of uh, when she decided to start giving writing assignments when there was uh, enough, when the, the principal allowed her to, when there was uh, less time to focus on standardized tests to allow students to write, she could learn, she could see how much the kid there was an equity providing experience because the students would uh, be out the opportunity to express themselves uh, and show their their skills and their thoughts uh, in ways that was impossible if all they're doing is teaching to the test. Uh, so that that's a that's mm -hmm. a big deal, uh, you know. And we and then related to that was the idea that uh, sometimes when you these schools that are uh, poorly funded, you get a climate kind of of where students aren't happy. Uh, also, if, if the school facility is is bad in need of repair, that's like a sign of show of disrespect. The students students go to another school. They see other kids doing sports, 
from a nicer school that's better funded and then they look at their own school and they see that it's, it's falling apart you know and 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 they 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 say that that's a really uh, a big blow to to their self-respect their self-esteem uh so facilities mean a lot but uh just this issue around the, the schools that often the times like when you get like a low performing school the teacher the, the administrators are even more obsessed with standardized tests to get those mm-hmm. scores up so what they do is they have a even more of a regimented curriculum where the teach students are just being plugged in with information and not being allowed to express themselves in ways that show their individuality mm-hmm. and the students get turned off to the educational system so it kind of it's like a it feeds itself you know it's kind of this sort of downward mm-hmm. spiral of, of negativity that where all the fact all the parts of the system kind of uh feed each other negatively interesting yeah okay i think that's pretty much it for us so the others wanted to add something did i miss anything from our group <laughs> okay. okay thank you thank you so much uh and now let's have a report out from tony's group yeah, so I mentioned a few points that have not been mentioned by the other groups and uh, then ask if anyone from our group would like to chime in and add other things. Um, but what we talked about was fact, you know, we talked about all the different areas, uh, but a key thing was what factors do you think reflect learning outcomes? And we really came up with the parent parental involvement, very, very critical language barriers. If kids um, have a problem with English, it's very, very hard for them to catch up. And uh, Leanne, who's a, a current teacher, talked about your dual immersion schools where kids do really well because there's a lot of parental involvement and there's no language issue, et cetera. Uh, we talked about the lack of emphasis on learning disabilities. We need to provide funding to train. We provide, need to provide training for teachers to deal with learning disabilities and other problem areas in, in, uh, that kids uh, face. We have factors outside of the school environment, like the time it takes to get to school if kids are bused from one from their hub from their home to a, to a, a different school, like from East Palo Alto to Palo Alto. Issues of poverty, lack of space in the home to do homework, uh, no quiet no quiet space to do homework. Um, kids in wealthier families, uh, more privileged families, tend to have others around who can help with their studies. If they got well-educated parents, they can help them deal with some, some math problems, et cetera. We also talk about student engagement, that uh, student engagement is very, very critical. And I thought it was interesting what Dan said, uh, that in some school districts where, where the facilities are not so good, that that can impact, impact student engagement. And we talk about the COVID year being absolutely disastrous for student engagement. And also all the modern technologies, the, um, you know, the smartphones, the social media being uh, disastrous for a student engagement. Um, we also talked about the need for, uh, I mentioned earlier about extra funding to train teachers for kids with special needs, but also we need fundings for electors like music and arts, which are a critical part of personality development. And we also need to uh, put an emphasis on civics. We talked about the outcomes we want to see. We want to see the that we want to have equity that kids all have the opportunity to develop to the maximum potential. We also talk about the fact that we want our nation to do well in the world economy, so we want to train all our kids. And of course, we want to make sure that, um, we want to make sure that our uh, young people are well educated so that we have a functional, functioning democracy. So those three areas were really important outcomes for us. Anybody else like to chime in from the group? I, I thought it was. I, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I I just wanted to um, mention um, our discussion about um, teacher training for students with learning disabilities. I feel like there's just been a huge emphasis on um, um, students. Uh, um, strategies for students who, um, for example, uh, are learning English as a second language. That, that, there's been a big emphasis on that. But I don't feel there's been enough um, training for, 
for teachers uh, to learn strategies in the classroom for um, to deal with students with learning disabilities mm -hmm. or even things like ADHD, which is not really considered a learning disability, but it's an attention disability. So I've never seen um, a professional development for something like that, but it's a huge thing. Oh. We see it all the time. <laughs> So um, I would love to see more of that. And that, of course, um, you know, needs more funding. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Anybody else? Well, Franco, and Marianne. I was asking Leanne about what, um, what approach she would take. And uh, even having multiple teachers in the classroom, because there are some have so many um, kids with different learning um approaches and that's that takes an awful lot of money so what's the best way to deal with um, all the different learning procedures uh, can i uh, yeah uh, i just wanted to mention that we we touched a little bit on the impact on education not only equity, but uh, adequacy uh, with the current COVID situation of how, how we might be able to recover our, our teachers and students uh, from the past year and um, what kind of remedial steps we might take to uh, quote unquote catch up. Yeah. Uh, I was going to add, like, about the issue of uh, kids with different needs. Um, I mean, that's been a big uh, debate in education, and it's kind of a, to some degree, it kind of touches on equity issues in the in the classroom, not around funding, but around individuality of a student and individual attention. Um, so, because you have every kid is different in a class, right? So, uh, and one one thing. That, you know, uh, what any teacher could do is provide opportunities for students to actively express what they know and what they don't know. Um, often that's not done. It takes a lot of teacher skill. So if, if nothing else, teachers could become better at asking questions and not lecturing students, but asking questions, giving the opportunity to write or to, to express their learning in various visualizations and other means, orally, written, whatever. Uh, and then and in addition to that, um, then you get into the issue of, well, with kids who are, I think Leanne, you was referring to kind of difference between mildly, they refer to as children with mild learning disabilities like ADHD versus children with severe learning disabilities. And those children with severe learning disabilities have to get IEPs or they get individual education plans. And they get like, you often get like an aid uh, that sits with them uh, in the class um, and those are kids who have like s the severe meaning you know they're I mean they they, they their attention well it's not attention span it's like they can't they can't see or they you know or um, or something like that you know so, uh, uh, so there is a big discrepancy there and I think you should make a good point about that but uh, the uh, the learning uh, but every kid, you know, uh, and then the other uh, the other issue is how do you group students? There have been movements in education toward mainstreaming. That's the term that's used for throw all the kids together in the same class, uh, make a diverse class, make it hetero make it heterogeneous versus the more homogeneous idea like let's track kids, let's put kids into the one group because they're doing better on the test than the other kids. So, uh, and it, the movement. And that, there, there are trade-offs. Uh, that debate's been going on for decades in education around mainstreaming versus um, versus uh, putting kids into different tracks based on various outcome measures that are looked at. <laughs> I'd like to add to Tony's comment about um, civics. Um, because we also talked about in our group the emphasis on you know, doing well on the test, the state standardized testing. And um, when we had a school, it was a middle school that was not, the scores had been down for uh, several years. 
And so they restructured how they were going to um, emphasize more of the math, science, and English. And in order to do that within the hours of the school day, they cut out the social sciences. And I guess as a social science teacher, I better qualify myself here. Um, civics education is not thought of in the same way as STEM classes. And I, and this has been for a while, there's, you know, Supreme Court justices have been talking about this for a while. And um, even regular judges, when, when they're sitting trying to find a jury, how little people understand about our system that we live in. So civic education has taken a back seat. And I think um, personally, uh, we see the results of a lack of knowledge about how this democracy works. And when Ben Franklin walked out of the, the room in Philadelphia and, and said, we have a republic if we can keep it. Yeah. And he was an advocate of public education for that very reason, to teach civics. We're not doing that. It's taken the back seat. Mm -hmm. I want to add something to that, Sean, because I, I, as in my many years as an educational researcher going for federal grants, um, I can tell you that I was a social studies teacher and government teacher in my, when I started my career, and I wanted to do more in that, but I, for financial reasons, had to kind of ditch that and go into STEM because there wasn't any money uh, in any, any grant funding in, uh, for, uh, in, uh, in anything other than science and math uh, and technology. Um, so uh, in what I end up doing is a lot of environmental science because that was kind of the one science where you kind of get into social sort of issues a little bit, but, but I totally agree. I mean, you cannot, uh, it, it, it goes all the way down, all the innovative stuff, a lot of it gets funded by the feds, Department mm -hmm. of Education, by National Science Foundation, by, uh, and they don't fund social civic, civic learning mm -hmm. pretty much. It's very, so, uh. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to our conversation when, um, uh, I, can't, I don't see her, Ellen, I think was her name, but I don't see her on here right now. Um, when she was talking about early childhood education and the importance, oh, it is Ellen Wheeler. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Um, she was talking about the importance of our, you know, that first five years of formative learning and um, we want to spend money. We don't want to spend it up front. And we all end up as citizens paying our taxes, um, trying to play the catch up game. And I see the same thing with what you're saying, Dan, uh, where the funding is. We're not focusing on making sure that education is equal in what we believe young people ought to know as, a, as citizens of our country. And certainly if we all care about democracy, and we understand public education, the purpose of public education is to raise citizens that are virtuous, hard workers that contribute. Um, we're certainly not putting the money up front to make sure that happens. And I think now look what we are all have, our taxpayer dollars are going to. We're, um, we're I'd, I'd like to um, make a point that there is a uh, civics education group in the Palo Alto League that is planning to have a, um, I think they're planning to have a caucus at the state convention. And one of our re re uh, recommendations for the state at our program planning was to focus on civics education. And we believe this is something that's gonna come from the state. Mm -hmm. um, although the federal government funding is also um, dis disparate towards science and math, but, um, I think this is uh, one of the things that the question that we didn't have, uh, I didn't feel we got a good grip on in our group about what values should we honor in school funding, but perhaps that is a value. What values, what is an education for? Um, and it is to create good citizens as well as good employees. Um, and I think we forget that quite often. Yeah, and you actually see that reflected in the classroom. Like when I was a social studies teacher, kids would say, why do I need to learn this? Is this going to get me a job? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they don't see yeah. the connection. You know, the idea that they need to be of good citizenship just doesn't. Mm. You know, it, yeah. it's it's unfortunate, but um, uh, you hear that. 
Carol has posted a link to what the state says for the K-12 history framework. Yeah, but you know what the difference is? I, I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot, but I know a lot about this stuff. Uh, the, uh, the thing is that social studies and civics is not tested on standardized tests. Yeah. The teaching, teachers, the money comes from, and the, the community cares about its test scores for two reasons. One is because it, it, it's, it's the big reward. Mm -hmm. Communities care about it because when, when people go looking for houses and they talk to real estate agents, they look at what the test scores are in this, this district. So the test scores support this, are this measure that, that is used to make the, to, you know, yeah, differentiate. Yeah. And, then, and, the, and the tests are reading and math. Mm -hmm. Even science doesn't get much attention. I mean, science gets attention because of National Science Foundation, you know, there certainly gets more concern than civics, but if they had a civics test, standardized test, there would be a lot more attention to civics, but there isn't one. So maybe that's something to focus on. So does this, does this get us started in our conversation on what do we do next? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Well, I'd like to make a point here that we, we put an awful lot of emphasis on discussion around school funding and you know, where does this funding come from and so on. But I don't think we put enough attention on to what the outcomes are that we want. Do we want to get the same funding to all the school districts, for all the students, have every student get the same amount of funding, or do we want to put the money where we can get the biggest bang for the buck, which means uh, probably investing a lot more in some of the uh, less privileged areas and I think there's not enough discussion about that. Yeah. And you, uh, Judy Polk has her hand up. I, I, I really agree with both Dan and Tony and, and all of you. It's just one of the things I remember when I was in, particularly when I was a classroom teacher, it was every, it would just seem like every two or three years, there was a new thing to do. And the other teachers here may remember that, that there's always a new solution. And you were constantly feeling like you have to start over again. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe Ellen, you have experienced some of that. I, I particularly heard other teachers be concerned because I've just really gotten going on this uh, using this strategy and now they want me to use this strategy and uh, and then it seems a lot of law is made by, in the legislature rather than um, among educators. So what would you say would be the solution to that, Judy? I, oh, Leanne you know, wants to talk. If I had a solution, I'd be president. <laughs> well, we Aren't already have Tony, Tony uh, in the running for that. <laughs> Leanne has something to say about that. No, I just have to tell you, I have to go. I have to head up to San Francisco, which I'm oh. not really looking forward to, but I have to go. <laughs> oh. okay. Okay. Right. Thank you thanks, for being yeah, here, Leanne. Thanks thanks for thank you so much. Thank you. Great great you. Yeah. And thank you. Will, this is we will be great. sending you information, more information and a link to the recording. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great discussion. Love it. Oh, thank you. Thank you Bye. Have a great trip. Yeah, that link came from Leanne, by the way. Oh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. I have a, a, a suggestion, which is unpopular with probably this group here. Um, and that is, uh, I believe in, I guess it's called the script uh, program, you know, where uh, the government will, if you don't want to put your kids in, in public school, then you can put them in private school. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is that called? Is that uh, called? Vouchers. 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 Yeah, Vouchers. Yeah. I, I thought it was a different name. But I, I think the voucher should be on schools that are underperforming, not uh, regular schools. So uh, I think that if, if a school district is not able, for whatever reason, to, uh, to teach the students in that area, this is primarily those minority areas where, um, you know, parents uh, work a lot and, and there are a lot of conditions which make it difficult for kids to, to learn properly. 
that uh, that a voucher be given to uh, to those areas so that they can go have an option to go to um, to a private school. Um, I don't believe it's appropriate for this area here because we are too wealthy here. And even though Cupertino is having a, a big struggle here, and I'm part of Cupertino School District, um, I, I don't think we deserve a, a voucher. But I do see areas in the United uh, in in California, in um, in the Valley and other areas where a voucher might be a, a good alternative, because edu educating your kids is the bottom line. You want to get them to get the right education. And if a public school can't do that, then they have no alternative right now, they're too poor. So why not allow them to seek out other options as well? I know this is unpopular, yeah. but this Sergeant, is my thought. Uh, I have a question. Do you think that these, uh, should these fund um, private schools or public uh, charter schools like where there's like basically the teacher, the parents make the decisions but it's still part of the district or, or a combination? No, I, I, think it, I think it should be uh, private schools, just vouchers. Uh, they could still go to uh, those other schools if they want to. But um, I'm talking about these poor areas where there's not much option for them to, uh, to take alternative education in public schools. So I think that poor people, one of the problems they're having is, is the poor people cannot afford to put their kids into private schools. A lot of problem is uh, discipline in, in public schools is a problem. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of dropouts and discipline problems. But that, that the, since the, the private schools tend to be a little bit more controlling, uh, they, mm -hmm. a lot of, even a lot of the kids around here, if they have problems with their kids, uh, then they send them to private schools because they know that the private schools can control them a little better. Um um, I, I'd just like to say, I think that would be a very interesting um, topic to discuss because there are so many issues. The only one that I would raise in immediate response is in poor areas, there probably are not private schools that are readily accessible and mm -hmm. the schools have to be willing to take these students. So um, those are the two big things in my mind that um, make it, the, the practical questions you have to ask is what schools would they actually be going to? And also the parents have to make these choices when they can barely make a living. So yeah, but, but there, right are now they, there are issues, there are issues. But right it would be an interesting discussion. Yeah, because right now there's no option. And, and this gives them an option. Maybe they can't afford to transport them. Maybe they get scholarships from the schools to have them uh, transported and other things because right. there's a lot of private schools that give funding to students you know, to uh, attend as well. But if they have some subsidies from the, the state, a voucher to help uh, defer a lot of the expenses, then they can find schools that maybe will work. Or maybe schools, private schools, will try to develop programs along those. I'm just looking for alternatives right now. Right now, there's no alternative. That's a problem. They don't have a choice. They go or they drop out of school. I say, better to go than to drop out of school or to have a lot of truancy and stuff like that. One problem with the voucher, of course, is the vouchers may not provide sufficient money uh, to pay for the high fees of a private school. However, in a number of developing countries, there are some NGOs or private companies that have set up uh, whole networks of schools, you know, hundreds or thousands of schools, where the fees are low enough that even relatively poor people can afford them I don't believe we have any of those networks here in the US, um, only on a very small scale, I think. But that might be an alternative for us because certainly I don't think that if you give poor people, you know, people in a poor school district, a $10,000 voucher, I doubt if that will help them go to a private school where there might be, you know, if you're lucky, $30,000 a year fees. Well, maybe it would be more than that. We don't know, but we have a problem we have to solve, right? I, and right now it's not being solved. Got a question Agreed, for Frank. you, Frank? Frank, um, well, first I want to comment on Tony. Tony, there is the Catholic schools. They're True. Pretty, yes. You know, and that's a big network of, of schools that are Catholic that are pretty cheap to go to. But Frank, I had a question for you. T can you explain, like, what is it about a private school client, kind of the school culture that uh, that you've seen uh, that makes it 
uh, like more orderly or provide a better learning environment for than that kind of poor public school that has all the classroom management issues and the kind of the sort of what have you seen about it? what is it can you explain that a little bit because you, you alluded yes to that. yeah I can <laughs> um, I, I have experience with parents who sent them their kids Cupertino kids to Catholic schools specifically mm -hmm. because the Catholic schools are more disciplined and they do uh, make sure the kids get to school and if they don't then they you know they explore and they take action to do that. In public schools, there's so many kids that are truant. The kids are so naughty in classes and things like that. In Catholic schools, they don't allow that. There, there are ways that they take care of kids that are probably not allowed in public schools, but are allowed in private schools. Hmm. Because private schools have a lot more liberties. They're not so well regulated as public schools. So they can do things that public schools can't. I'm not saying what they do, but I have experience where people who have ADD uh, children or have kids who are in drugs and stuff like that uh, in Cupertino who've sent their kids to private Catholic schools for that reason. And I'm sure there are other schools that, that aren't Catholic, but my experience has been with Catholic schools. I'm not Catholic, but right. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think this is, this is an excellent discussion. And it is uh, the, the private school solution is one of many. Uh, another one might be models that in other countries that we might want to take a look at. Are, are there any other thoughts, ideas that people have to address this issue of equity in education? So uh, Marie Ann, this is Ellen Wheeler. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things that's obvious to me looking at those slides back at the very beginning, and I think LWBC is working on this. I know school boards are working on this and you know, plant it in your head and think about it all the time is we should have a 55% uh, parcel tax. So uh, you know, we talked about how you know, some of these wealthier districts are able to raise money uh, you know, and they're able to get 66% of their voters to approve it, whereas uh, a lot of poorer school districts cannot reach that 66%, but many of them can reach 55%. Mm. So uh, that's, I think, a ready uh, solution for uh, some of these problems. So, and this would be statewide? Yeah. Okay, any, any other thoughts on this? Because I'm getting, I think we're getting close. Um, I think we did have yeah. one other, sort of came out, but just the need to um, fully fund our public schools. That um, the fact that, that there are wealthy, wealthy districts who can spend essentially all the money they want. And there are other districts that have no hope of achieving that. And we see the difference between say, Gilroy and Palo Alto. What we need is a commitment from the state to bring all schools up to the level. As you say, we're, we're even below the national average and yet even um, Gilroy is quite close to the national average. So there's much more, you know, money isn't everything but it does pay for teacher time. It does pay for after school time. We talked about kids being able to stay on the school grounds after school in order to get support while doing their homework. Um, it pays for, uh, community support. It pays for more, you know, more labs. It pays for more social studies. Um, so just paying for schools and somehow promoting the idea, trying to convince people that education is is our future if we have one. And, and also, yes, Tony. I was just following up from what Ellen, you were just saying, I totally agree with you. If we at least agree, can agree that our local control funding formula needs to be increased to a level that's that can provide uh, that at least the national average. Hopefully, it's at the it's uh, it should at least be the national average. Yeah. Probably higher because of our high cost of living. And in addition, we need to increase that twenty percent that we allocate for students with special needs. 
I don't think that is in any way near what's needed. And some of the teachers online here can maybe say, what do you need? How much F extra effort do you need for a kid that is dyslexic or doesn't speak English? I imagine you can need twice the time easily for those kids. So a lot more than 20% would be needed. And I, I would like to suggest that our citizens, our country, needs to start looking at education as a right and a responsibility for the state to fund. Not the state as California only, but the country. And rather than looking at it as another added tax base, another added expense, we should be educating our citizens based on the fact that they deserve that education. And we as a country need it to continue our democracy. Yeah, well said. Any other yeah, thoughts before we close? Yes, uh, I, I totally agree with that. I, um, I don't know why America thinks so little about education and especially California. I don't understand why California thinks so little about education that they're not willing, that we citizens aren't willing to give students and schools enough money to educate our, uh, our students properly. Basic aid schools are only like less than 10% of all the schools in California. 90% of schools are, um, are LCFF. Uh, districts. And uh, I don't know why all, all the school districts have to be treated so financially um, inequitable uh, in, in one of the richest areas in the world. I, I don't understand You're that. here. <laughs> yep. 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 Any other thoughts before we... Last thing I'm going to say is Proposition 15. Uh, we tried to get that change because, you know, corporations are, uh, they don't pay their tax base uh, as much as they should to contribute to what happens in California. Oops. So unfortunately, it, it got close, but it, it didn't get where it needed to be to pass, which would have helped a lot. Yes, this, again. Is, <laughs> this is something that, that we all worked on, I know. Uh, any other thoughts? This is oh, one final thought. Yeah, you would, when you look at COVID, our discussion on COVID in the past year, uh, especially among our wonderful uh, national leaders, the lack of scientific understanding, mm -hmm. the lack of understanding of how the scientific process works has cost lives in our country, not just uh, been a huge uh, problem with our democracy, but it's actually cost lives because people do not understand how science works. And they don't understand that science moves back and forth and moves in a, a linearly, don't understand that scientists uh, make a mistake and then they do more research and more get more data, they correct the mistake. Even these fundamental things about science are not understood by our national leaders, some of our national leaders. Yeah. I, I just want to add uh, just, you know, the thought about the, uh, the state and uh, California and its kind of dismal record in education. I'm wondering, like, It'd be interesting to look at do an analysis of where does the money that California gets through taxes, where does that money get spent? Because California is a very high tax state, yet it, it gives so little to education. Well, where does that money go? Is it being well spent? Uh, uh, well, I think, <laughs> Judy, do you have any comments on that? Actually, there is a there was a Proposition 98, which we did not go into in our background, that mandates a certain percentage of the state budget every year goes to education. I think it's still the fact that it's not, um, it's not equitably shared mm. or we just haven't we have not addressed a lot of societal problems that may create these challenges for school districts. Mm -hmm. I think most educators are dedicated. They want to do a good job. They do their best. But it's sometimes just 
a very hard thing to accomplish. Yeah, yeah, yeah one third of our complex issue. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah one third of our budget is uh, education. It's the largest budget item uh, in the state. Yes, but it's still, is. but it's still not enough. True. Okay. Thanks but again. Having money is not the only answer. So. Yeah. <laughs> And we will be we will be sending you a document on uh, the issue advisory with a little bit more uh, information about the topic, as well as a link uh, in a, uh, to the recording uh, in a couple days. I really we really appreciate your participation. Uh, I think we all learned a lot, and we owe it all to each other. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you. Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. A great discussion, everyone.